This is San Francisco, as it looks from Telegraph Hill. And this is the house on Telegraph Hill, where I once thought I would find peace and contentment. This is how it looks today, but my story begins 11 years ago and 7,000 miles away in another house near Warsaw, in my native Poland. My name is Victoria Kowalska, and this was my home. It looked like this in 1939, when my husband came home on leave. And this is what was left after the Germans had passed. In one stroke, I had lost my husband, my home, everything I held dear, and had become one of the thousands of miserable strays who were herded into prisons and concentration camps. How the will to live survives in a place like Belsen, I do not know. But I wanted to live. I was determined to. And I was just as determined that my friend Karin Durnakova should live too. I had met Karin, a fellow countrywoman, in the camp. But she was sick and frail, too frail for the life of that camp. And she had more to live for than most of us. Her infant son had been smuggled out of Poland just before the war to an aunt in San Francisco. And if she ever lived through this, she would join them. Just think, Vicky, he's talking and walking by now. And if he would see me, he wouldn't even know me. Please, Karen, you must eat. You must keep up your strength. So you, Mickey. I'll never get out of here. Never see my Christopher again. Let go! You dirty hypocrite! You don't care about her any more than I do. You only stick to her like a leech because she has rich relatives in America. Oh, oh. you think she's going to take care of you when we get out of here? She'll never get out of here alive. None of us will ever get out of here alive. Okay. We are going to get out. We are. Eat your food. You will come to America with me, Vicky, won't you? Aunt Sophie has a big house on the hill. She lives there, alone with my Christopher. She will be glad if I bring you because you've helped me so much. Okay. Karen was my friend, and I fought for her survival as I fought for my own. But in the end, I was beaten. I had done everything I could for her. I stole food, medicine, and I fought off the others. I had tried to keep her mind filled only with thoughts of her son and her aunt. But with the German army on the run and liberation only days away, Karen Dernakova and our dreams of America lay on the cold floor of Belsen. All of Karen's identification was in that bundle. Her aunt had not seen her since she was a little girl. I knew as much about Karen's life as about my own. Why not? Why shouldn't I be Karen Dernakova? Three days later, I came before the Liberators. See, she's at the nation. Setzen Sie sich doch hin. Ihr Name, bitte. Ihr Name, bitte. Karin Dernakova. Haben Sie irgendwelche Papiere? She's scared to death. Tell her we're her friends, that we want to help her find her home, her family. Yes, sir. 
Wir sind Ihre Freunde. Wir wollen Ihnen helfen, um Ihre Familie, Ihre Verwandten zu finden. Get some water. Here. Drink. Tell her not to be afraid that nobody's going to hurt her. Haben Sie doch keine Angst. Keiner wird Ihnen wehtun. Yeah, that's better. I'm all right now. Do you speak English? A little. I learned it at school. I'm sorry to make you all this trouble. You make us all the trouble you want. Yell if you'd like to. You're entitled to it. Some more of the same stuff, sir. You're from Warsaw? Yes. Well, you'll want to go back home as soon as possible, I suppose. I had no home. It was destroyed. No. I meant back to your family. No family left in Poland. My... My parents were killed, my husband also. I'm sorry. In other words, you don't want to be repatriated. Oh, no. no. Poland does not exist anymore for me. If you force me to go back... We're here to help people, not to force anybody to do anything. I feel I should explain, though, that the alternative is a camp for displaced persons. I'm afraid that isn't a permanent solution, either. Do you have any idea what you would like to do? Why? Oh, yeah. I will take care of myself somehow. I guess that's all for now. Thank you, Major. You're very kind. Just a minute. This must have fallen out of your bundle. Belongs to a Victoria Kobelska. Who is she? She's dead. Well, how do you happen to have this? She was my friend. We kept our things together. She would not need this anymore. So now, for better or for worse. I was Karen Dernakova. I was soon transferred to a displaced persons camp. The moment I arrived there, I sent a cable to Aunt Sophie in America and signed Karen's name to it. The answer came in a few days. Karen Dernakova. Dernakova? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. There it is. Just came across to the message center. I'll read it for you. Your cable addressed to Mrs. John Albertson forwarded to us. Advise addressee deceased. Exa deceased means the person's dead. Exhaustive search revealed all known relatives abroad dead. Address all further communications to our Eastern representative, Joseph C. Callahan, attorney, New York City. Signed, Bennett, Compton, and Maxwell, attorneys for the Albertson estate. I'll make a copy for you. And that was my answer. A cable from an unknown lawyer in the unattainable city of New York. And my hopes gone with that cable. In that moment, I nearly gave up. But I had lived with my dream too long. And the idea of getting to America had become an obsession. When the day finally came for me to join hundreds of others and go aboard the United Nations refugee ship, we could hardly believe it. We had spent the four long years since the end of the war in waiting, hoping, and praying. Now we were actually sailing, and we moved doubtfully, fearful that at the last moment we might be snatched back. But on that day in 1950, when I reached New York and found my way to the office of the lawyer who had sent me the cable, I knew that I would never let anything send me back. Mrs. Denakova. When you gave up your child almost nine years ago... I did not give him up. He was sent to America to save his life. Uh, nevertheless, the fact remains that others, not you, have taken care of the boy since he was an infant. It was my fault that I wasn't able to come here years ago to take care of him. You know, of course, that 
After Mrs. Albertson's death, Mr. Spender adopted the boy. But he had no right to do that while the child's mother was still alive. Well, we had every reason to believe that you were dead. All the reports indicated it. As a matter of fact, there is uh, still some doubt. As but you have seen my papers. What more proof do you want? My dear madam, you must realize that there is a considerable fortune involved here. I think you are the one who realizes it more than I. Mrs. Denakova, the law is on our side. Your aunt, I mean the late Mrs. Albertson, left the estate to the boy with Mr. Spender as guardian. It is true that the law, as you say, is on your side. I am in a strange country and I'm alone. But I have a feeling that here in some way I will find justice. I don't care how long it takes. I will fight for what belongs to me. And I will never let you keep my son from me. I uh, think you're being hasty. We might be prepared to settle this on some reasonable basis. Just a minute, Callahan. Mrs. Denagava. Yes? I'm sorry to have put you through this ordeal, but you see, I, I had to be positive. I'm sure you'll agree there's Chris to consider too. And if we both started there, unselfishly, we might find some solution to this problem. Without lawyers. What's the matter? Don't you like our food? Oh, yes. But I'm still upset. Your lawyer is so very efficient. Oh, forget about him. Let's talk about you. I didn't know I had such a beautiful relative in Poland. What? Oh, don't look so surprised. Aunt Sophie was related to me, too. By marriage. Oh. If she were alive, I would have been with her long ago. I sent her a cable. Yes, I know. You know? Well, look. Let me explain. You and your husband had been reported dead years before. My lawyer was convinced we were dealing with an imposter. I never heard from you again. That only served to confirm our original suspicions. If only had tried again, written, or wired, or anything. Well, I... I didn't know what to do, where to turn. I... I felt so lost. Well, you've got to forget all that now. Think of the future. And Chris. You'll be proud of him. Tell me about him. What does he look like? Well, he's a very good-looking boy, I think. He resembles you in some ways. Has your eyes and that same stubborn chin. <laughs> when he was a baby, everybody said he'd look more like his father. <laughs> when am I going to see him? He won't be back from school for two weeks. I plan to stay in New York on business. Look. Why don't you wait and come to San Francisco with me? I'm sure you could use the time yourself. Uh, shopping, for example. Shopping? But I have no money. You have now. This is what I had dreamed about. Like the days back home in Poland before the war. The feel of silk on my skin again. What do you think? It's lovely. Yes, but... I'm afraid it's also very expensive. Well, don't worry about that. After all, I'm still Chris's guardian. I'm sure he'd want his mother to look her best. Uh, all right, then. <laughs> do you like it? It's beautiful. I just have to put my shoe on and I'm ready. May I help you? I make no excuse. I felt Alan was attracted to me and I was prepared to take advantage of it. Was I in love with him? I don't know. But I did know that the best way for me to be safe was to be married to an American.
penny for them, Karen. A penny for what? Your thoughts. It's an expression we have. Oh, oh well, Anna. I couldn't begin to tell you all my thoughts. You've been so wonderful to me. I don't know if I ever can, Karen, but... I'd like to spend the rest of my life trying to make up to you for all those lost years. I want you to know I'm no bargain. I'm a very stubborn man. Set in my ways, hard to live with. And maybe I'm too old to change. I don't want you to change, Ellen. Three days later, we were married in Connecticut. And now Alan was bringing me home to San Francisco. There they are! Oh. Hello, Chris. Chris, this is your mother. Well, what do you think? Shall we keep her? Chris. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Mr. Spender. Darling, this is Margaret. How do you do? Welcome home, Mrs. Spender. Thank you. I've heard how much you've done for Chris. I'm very grateful. May I offer my congratulations? Well, thank you, Margaret. Well, let's go get the taste of the train out of our mouths, huh? So at last, I came to the house on Telegraph Hill. Wait till you see the view in the daytime. Come on now, Chris, it's way past your bedtime. Remember now, you promised. Okay. Can I help you carry it? Thank you, dear. If there's anything doesn't please you, just holler. We'll change it any way you like. Oh, no, I like it just as it is. So old and beautiful. See the house tomorrow. All right. That's a beautiful portrait of Aunt Sophie. I wish I had known her better. I never realized you knew her at all. Oh, yes. Once, when I was very little, she visited us in Poland. She looked so kind and wise. She was that. She was a wonderful woman. Well, thank you, dear. This is my room. You want to see it? Uh, tomorrow, Chris. Your mother's tired and it's way past your bedtime. Yes, Chris, I am a little tired. I'll show you the whole place tomorrow if you want. I know a place where you can see Point Lobos. That's where they used to send the signals from. That would be very nice. Good night, Chris. <laughs> Sleep well, darling. I'll see you in the morning. Okay. Good night. I, uh... I didn't know what arrangements you'd want to make, so I had the guest room made up for the night. Thank you, Margaret. Good night, Mrs. Spender. Good night, Margaret. There are so many things you'll have to teach me. I'll be glad to do what I can. Here we are, right down here. This is lovely. I'm glad you like it. Some people thought I was crazy to stay on in the house after Aunt Sophie died, but... I always loved the old place. You take that chair, for instance. It's a monstrosity, isn't it? I wouldn't give that up for anything in the world. When I was a kid, my mother and I used to come out to the house on special occasions. On Thanksgiving, Christmas, Aunt Sophie's birthdays. You see, we weren't immediate family, more like poor relations. But Aunt Sophie would always have us up for those family days. And I always loved that chair. I sat in it every time, came to think of it as my chair. Uh. It, it was a symbol to me then of this house, the life that was lived in it. It still is.
Come in. Thank you, Kai. Good night, sir. Good night. I always had a glass of orange juice just before going to bed. Oh. oh don't forget, I'm a native Californian. <laughs> mm. Good idea. Why did Margaret have the guest room made up? Oh, I suppose I should have sent her some instructions, but I wanted to leave everything to you. I think this room is big enough for both of us. I hope so. I do think you'll be more comfortable here if I take the guest room for tonight, and tomorrow we can go downtown and pick out everything we need. Alan, I love you. I had come halfway across the world, and now suddenly, in this pleasant room, a little of the fear I had once felt in Belson came back to me. Whether it was my own conscience, the meeting with little Chris, or something in the house itself, I couldn't tell. I had a strange feeling that Aunt Sophie saw through me. I wondered if I could have spoken to her whether she would have understood. She did look kind and wise. Yet I couldn't rid myself of the feeling that something was wrong in this house. I just came down to see Aunt Sophie's picture. It's kind of a strange hour to be prowling around the house looking at pictures. Oh, I'm not prowling, Alan. I'm sorry, but you seem so tired. And you? You haven't been to bed at all yet. I came down to look over my mail. I wanted to see if there's anything important. Well, Margaret heard me coming down. She brought me a sandwich and a glass of milk. Oh. Margaret has been in the house a long time, hasn't she? Ever since Chris was brought here from Europe. He needed someone to look after him. She's been very faithful. You know, one thing about Aunt Sophie, she knew people inside out. She picked her out of 50 applicants to take care of Chris. Margaret has many unusual qualities. I believe you. I also think she's a very unusual woman. Are you going to be much longer? No, just a little while. You better run along to bed. Good night. Hurt at all. That's good. Come on, throw the ball. Chris. 
You've missed not having your mother very much, haven't you? Sure, I guess so. But you were so little when you were brought here. You, you couldn't possibly remember her. Well, Aunt Sophie always talked about you a lot and cried for a long time when he told her you would die. And you? Did you cry too? I... I don't remember. It made me feel kind of funny. But anyway, it isn't true. Come on, pitch! Pitch? You know, throw it. Oh. Oh, oh I am so clumsy. Don't worry, you'll learn, Mom. Hey, oh. good one, Yippee! To the lady of the house, past and present, may your days in this house be as rich and rewarding as hers. Thank you, Doctor. A great character. Don't make him like that anymore. Nobody knows that any better than I do. She was a wonderful, wonderful woman. She had a wonderful sense of humor. In fact, she'd laugh her head off if she could see this little votive group gathered under her portrait, drinking her vintage wine, growing mawkish over her memory. Hello, Alan. Mr. Burkhardt. Why? Mr. Whitmore. Hello, Mark. Mrs. Whitmore. You look lovely tonight. Oh, thank you, Mark. There's a rumor around town that you've gotten married. Comes with a great wailing and gnashing of teeth from the direction of Knob Hill. Darling, may I present Mark Bennett. He's an old friend. We've known each other since grammar school. My wife. Mrs. Spender? Something on your mind, old boy? Frankly, yes. I, uh... How far behind am I? Well, I'd say you had a pretty good head start. Uh, you seem to have run down suddenly. How about a nice friendly push? Sure. Champagne all right? Whiskey with a little water, if you don't mind, but don't drown it. That would be a catastrophe, huh? Fix it for you myself. You don't remember me, do you? You're making things tougher for me by the minute. That accent's Polish. Uh -huh. On what red letter day did I meet a beautiful Polish lady? On the most important day in her life, Major. Germany. The camp at Belsen, of course. But you've changed quite a bit. No wonder I didn't recognize you. I've often wondered what had become of you. <laughs> I don't believe you remember anything about me at all. Oh, but I do. I, I even remember your name. It's Victoria, Victoria Der... Der Nakova, Major. And it's Karen. Not Victoria. Karen. K-A-R-I-N. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Thank you. Dinner is served. Thank you, Karen. May I claim the right as an old friend of the household? Mm -hmm. Looks like you have already. Shame to wake him, even for ice cream. Take a favor for a favor. Thanks. Oh, don't you like it? Oh, sure, but Margaret. Yes. Well, she usually doesn't let me eat after dinner. Oh, but this is a special occasion, isn't it? Oh, sure. And maybe you just won't tell Margaret, huh? She'll find out. <laughs> Something wrong, Mrs. Bender? Nothing at all, Margaret. I just brought Chris a dish of ice cream. Chris doesn't usually eat just before going to bed. Well, I just thought with everybody having fun downstairs that... Of course, if, if you prefer him not to have it, I... Well, not at all. It's up to Chris. What do you think, Chris? I can put it in the icebox for lunch tomorrow. Okay. 
we find it better to let Chris make his own decisions. I see. It will taste better at lunch, Chris. Good night, dear. I didn't realize it oh, was... Oh, it was my fault, Mrs. Spender. I should have told you. But Chris has always been a very impulsive child. I found the best way to handle him is to let him discipline himself. Good night, Margaret. Good night, Mrs. Spender. Five pounds. Nice avocado today. Zucchini. I recommend the zucchini. Major. The Dutch of garlic and mozzarella, there's nothing like it. Ciao della mozzarella. Si, signore, la migliore. All right, get the lady a couple of pounds. The real stuff now from the basement. Si, signore, the best. Small world, isn't it? Germany, Telegraph Hill, and the new Union Grocery. You do your marketing here too, Major? Only since I found it's where you do yours. Besides, we didn't have a chance to finish our talk the other evening. Oh, it isn't pleasant for me to talk about things that happened in the camp. I'd like to forget about them. That's, uh, that's not what I wanted to talk to you about. I was telling my cook about that chicken dish I had at your house the other night. She can't swing it without the recipe. <laughs> Don't laugh. I'm a San Franciscan, eating serious business with me. I thought the law was your business, Major. Technically, it is. You see, my father's death put me in a curious situation. According to the sign on the door, I'm the senior member of the firm, but most of our clients seem to want to do business with the junior members. One of them 65, the other 62. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll leave me twiddling my thumbs and cleaning out ashtrays. And finding your recipes for your cook. Exactly. <laughs> if I give you the recipe, will you tell me something too? Blackmail, huh? You and Ellen do not like each other. Why? Where did you ever get an idea like that? I saw you together at the house. Well, the fact is that Ellen thinks I've had things too easy all my life. You know, rich man's son, lazy, drinks too much. Unfortunately, he's right. Two pound mozzarella, the best. I tell me, I think these two. Well, I think this is everything. I'm sure you have some good points, Major. Oh, I suppose so. I'm kind to animals, handle the boat pretty well. And you play the piano beautifully. And I make beautiful circles on a bar with a high wall glass. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Spender. Let me know how you like the mozzarella. All right, I will, Tony. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, now that's all settled, how about lunch? I'm afraid I couldn't. Why not? Because you're married now? Believe me, I'm very much aware of it, and I respect it. Husbands are husbands, and friends are friends, and who knows, someday you might need a friend. Some other time, perhaps. They are expecting me home for lunch today. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm not fast enough for you. <laughs> Chris, a little playhouse. You never told me about it. I don't play anymore. It's no good. Oh, we will fix it and use it again. Here's the ball, Mom. Come on. <laughs> we had one at home. It was so much fun. Don't go in there. Is there something you don't want me to see? No, but it's dangerous. <laughs> Chris, what happened there? It was the explosion. Explosion? What kind of explosion? My chemical set. It happened a long time ago. Come on, Mom! Let's play some more ball! Tell me, darling. Were you hurt? No, it was nothing. It just made a loud noise. Well, I'm going to ask Alan to have it fixed. No, please don't, Mom. Why not? Because he doesn't know anything about it. He wasn't here when it happened. You won't tell him, Mom, will you? Of course not, if you don't want me to. We'll just keep it between us, okay? Okay, thanks, Mom. Come on, pitch! Pitch! 
edge. Good one. Throw it overhand like that. <laughs> Margaret? Margaret? Something you wanted, Miss Spender? Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret. I, I was looking for you, and I couldn't help admiring this beautiful album. Was it on Sophie's? Yes, she gave it to me. Oh, what is it you wanted, Mrs. Spender? Oh, I, I just wanted to ask you, what exactly happened in the little playhouse? The playhouse? Yes. Did Chris take you there? No, I. I came upon it by accident. I asked Chris, but he didn't want to talk about it. He did say there was an explosion from his chemical set. Oh, nonsense. His chemical set was just a harmless toy. He must have stolen something from the kitchen, some cleaning fluid or something that caused the explosion. Chris thinks Mr. Spender still doesn't know, but of course you told him, Margaret. No, I never did. Margaret, you should have. Well. Chris was terribly afraid Mr. Spender would punish him. He begged me not to tell. But Chris should have been made to understand never to do a thing like that. He could have been killed. Well, he wasn't. He wasn't hurt at all. I saw no reason to make an issue of it then, and certainly there's no reason to make an issue of it now. I'm not trying to make an issue of it, Margaret. But surely you can blame me for being worried and, and very much concerned. Concerned? How long have you been concerned about Chris? A few weeks? I've been concerned about him all his life, night and day. And now you tell me that you're concerned about something that happened years ago. Even then it was I who comforted him, not you. Thank you for being so frank. Now I know where we stand. From the moment I came here, you've looked upon me as an intruder in this house. That's why you dare talk to me like this. Well, I'll tell you something. You're wrong, Margaret. You are the intruder, not I. Are you giving me notice, Mrs. Bender? Yes. I was a fool not to do it long ago. Very well. I'll start packing at once. You would never get home. What's the matter? Anything wrong? No, not anymore. I had it out with Margaret. She's leaving. You what? Have you both gone crazy? Do you want to hear what happened? I don't care what happened. This is ridiculous. But darling, he wouldn't say that if you'd heard how she talked to me. She acted as if Chris was her child. And she even accused me of deliberately turning him against her and you. Oh. So it's about Chris. Well, catch us here, darling. Margaret is jealous because the boys become so attached to you. Now, you should be the first to understand that. And you, you should be the first to understand that Margaret and I can never live together in the same house. Now look, Karen. Margaret has given years of her life to Chris. You can't just dismiss her like a servant that stepped out of line. You're upset now, darling, but when you've had time to think it over, you'll realize I'm right. If Margaret said anything to you she shouldn't have, she'll apologize. I'll see to that myself. Come in. May I speak to you for a moment, Mrs. Bender? Please come in.
What is it, Margaret? About yesterday, I should like to apologize. I said things I shouldn't have, I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. Mr. Spender wishes you to remain, you know that. But things will be very difficult if you feel that I can't be trusted with Chris. What happened between us has nothing to do with Chris. I never doubted that you have Chris's welfare at heart. It's kind of you to say so, Mrs. Spender, but I'd feel better if you accepted my apology, too. Very well, I accepted it. If that makes you feel better. Isn't it time to bring Chris home from the party? I'm leaving right now. What are you doing in there? I... I was just looking around. Looking around? Mm-hmm. For what? Nothing, Alan. Nothing. I... I just wanted to see the inside of the playhouse. Like your present? Yep. Oh, tell me all about it. Well, we went on a pony ride. Karen. Darling, will you please tell me what's bothering you? I'm tired, Ellen. I... I have a headache. I don't mean now. I mean this afternoon in the playhouse. You shied away from me as if I had the plague. If I hadn't grabbed you, I completely forgot about that war. Forgot? Yeah, I should have had it fixed right after the explosion, but I didn't realize it was such a hazard. What's the matter now? You... You know what happened to Chris in the playhouse? <laughs> of course I do. Wasn't I supposed to know? Well, Margaret told me just the other day that you didn't know. That she never told you. Oh, well, you must have misunderstood. After four years, I don't suppose Margaret remembers herself just how it was. But it's certainly nothing for you to start worrying about now. Your hands are like ice. There's something going on in that funny little head of yours? Something you're keeping from me? I'm not keeping anything from you, Alan. I like to feel as though I'd failed you somehow. As though I hadn't been the husband I wanted to be. No, it isn't you, Alan. Sometimes things come back. Things I want to forget, I can't help it. You must be patient with me. I'll be all right. <laughs> of course you will, darling. It takes time. We'll just have to try harder to, to make you forget. Chris, 
You forgot to make up your room again. I didn't forget. I'm just going to mark it with Mom now. I'll do it when we get back. Oh, Chris, you promised. Go right in and do it now. I'll wait for you. Would you like me to go to the market for you, Mrs. Bender? Cook said he wanted the chops for lunch. Oh, that's right. Uh, no, I'll go, Margaret. <laughs> I'm sorry, darling. You come with me next time, okay? Okay. The motor off. Somebody get an ambulance. Yeah, I'll go get one now. I won't move around, lady. What happened? They're getting an ambulance for you. I don't want an ambulance. I'm all right. Somebody get it out here. You better let me take you home, huh, lady? Where do you live? Home? No, I. Please, will you take me to a telephone? Yeah, sure, sure thing, lady. Hello. Mr. Mark Bennett, please. Yes? Oh? Put her on. Hello, Karen. How are you? An accident? Are you all right? Oh. Yes. Well, let me call Alan. Oh, no, I don't want Alan to... Mark, please, don't call Alan. I want to see you alone, now. Well, all right, I just thought that... I'll be right there. What's the address? So after the man brought me here to the telephone, he sent for a tow car, and, and then he kept insisting I have a doctor look at he me right away. He should have. It was a terrible thing to have happen, and I still think... It didn't happen. It, it wasn't an accident. He made the brakes so they wouldn't work. He's trying to kill me. Hey, hey, let's not go off the deep end again. You've had a bad shot. Now, who's trying to kill you? Alan. Alan. Oh, Mark, please believe me, I'm not hysterical now. He wants to get rid of me. I felt it for a long time. Can't you say it, Mark? And Sophie left everything to Chris. Alan is his guardian. If something should happen to him, Alan would get the estate. And Chris could have been with me in the car this morning. He wants us out of the way. It's for the money, Mark. Don't you see it? You don't do it. But why would he marry you? He didn't have to, you know. He may have been attracted to me, I don't know, but... You don't think he was going to let the boy's mother take everything away from him, do you? Well, that's one way to find out. Come on. Your master cylinder's bone dry. These are hydraulic brakes. No fluid, they don't work. How come no fluid? A leak, right here. The brake in the line going to the front wheel. It's kind of an unusual place to spring a leak, isn't it? Well, it don't happen every day, but it can happen. Look, you went over this thing pretty thoroughly. Is it possible that somebody might have tampered with that brake line deliberately? Anything's possible. My guess is you hit a rock or something. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I suppose you think I'm crazy. But I cannot help it. I cannot help what I feel. Karen, it's no news to you that I'm not very fond of Alan. I think he'd do almost anything to hold on to the nice, cushy life he's made for himself. I don't think he'd be crazy enough to try a thing like this. I don't know. 
I don't know what to think anymore. I'm sorry to have given you so much trouble for nothing. For nothing? I told you once you might need a friend. You came to me as a friend. I don't consider that nothing. What you need is somebody to teach you how to relax and enjoy life. Something Alan never learned. He's been so busy trying to get up to that house on the hill that he's been blind to everything else. I must go home, Mark. Well, at least you stopped calling me Major. That's a net gain. And I went down to the kitchen for a glass of milk. You better come to bed. It's very late. Yes, Dad. In a minute. My client will be here in a few minutes. Can you give me any idea what your report will be on those gloves? I think I can. I want to run one more test as a double check, but... I see. No, I'll be right here waiting for it. Thanks. I just went up to see my insurance man. Well, where are you going? To the dentist. I have an appointment. Dr. Lipman? Mm -hmm. Darling, he's in the medical building. 
Oh. Oh, you're right. I... I wonder how the taxi driver could have made such a mistake. Well, I'm glad he did. It gives me a chance to give a beautiful lady a lift. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, it's almost four. I'll wait for you. We'll drive home together. Oh, I, I didn't realize it was so late. I... I'm afraid I've missed my appointment. Well, you can see him tomorrow. I'll tell you what, let's have an early dinner and take in a movie, huh? Uh-huh. Hello, Margaret. Good evening. Where's Chris? He's in his room listening to the radio. Any calls? Mr. Mark Bennett. Can you have any message? He just said he'd be in his office until 6, if either of you returned by then. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Mr. Bennett, please. Mr. Spender calling. Relax, darling. It can't be anything important. Hello, Mark. I understand you called. Oh, fine, thanks. How about yourself? Tonight? In just a minute, Karen's right here. I'll ask her. He wants to take us to dinner tonight. What do you say? Whatever you like, Helen. Well, Karen says she'd love to. Sure, 8.30 is fine. Mm-hmm. I'll see you then. What's the matter, darling? <laughs> I was just thinking I've spent so little time with Chris today. Oh, stop worrying about Chris for a change. It'll do you good to get out. Yes, Helen. Tongue in the lay. You know my thing. into your lamp. Long been Excuse me, I, I promise to call Chris and say good night. You must have a crystal ball. What do you mean? You called this afternoon, man. Yeah? Of course. I was just going to call you. Really? Anything special? It's about Karen. Karen? This afternoon, coming down from Charlie Decker's office, I ran into her in the lobby. She almost jumped out of her skin when she saw me. I could have sworn she was on her way up to see you. Was she, Mark? Why didn't you ask her? I did. She told me she was going up to see her dentist. That seems to settle it, doesn't it? No, not quite. You see, her dentist happens to be in the medical building. It's quite a long way from your place. She made a mistake, so what? People don't make mistakes like that, unless it's part of a pattern. Look, I'm not very good at riddles. What's on your mind? I'm worried about Karen. I don't have to tell you what she went through in Europe. I've tried everything to make her forget. I blame myself for letting her drive. That accident on the hill didn't help her nerves any. A thing like that would play hard with anybody's nerves. Of course, but with her it seems to... I don't know. Suddenly she's become suspicious of everything and everybody around her. I talked to Dr. Burkhardt about it. He suggested I take her to a specialist. I know you've never thought very much of me, Mark. Too pushing and ambitious for your taste. Or maybe you're right. But Karen's made a difference in my life. My only ambition now is to make her happy. And I'm helpless. 
the harder I try, the more I realize that I'm losing her. It's ironic, isn't it? Yeah, life's full of little ironies. And I'm afraid it's something you're going to have to work out between yourselves. Would you like to dance? Go ahead, darling. The report from the chemist, Mark. What does it say? I'm sorry, Karen. There wasn't a trace of grease or oil on those gloves. But those spots, Mark, those dark spots. Ink. Nothing but plain, ordinary blue-black ink. Karen, I'd like to tell you that Alan is a black-hearted monster capable of the worst crimes in the book. I can't. Because I'd be lying, and I... I can't lie to you. I know you've been through so much those years at the camp, and... But you've got to snap out of this mood. Oh, I'm not hysterical, Mark. Please believe me. I've realized now there was something wrong from the beginning. The way they tried to keep me from coming to America, the cold, heartless cable some lawyers sent me that Aunt Sophie was dead, and not a word about Chris. And what lawyers? I don't know. I don't remember their names. Why, is it important? No, I, I just wondered. I can show you the cable. Ellen doesn't know, but I still have it. I could bring it to your office. All right, why don't you? I'd like to get a look at it. All right, Mark, tomorrow. I'll bring it to your office in the morning, huh? All right. Oh, no. After what happened today, I... I shouldn't go there again. Where could we meet? Well, let me see. The yacht basin at the marina. Any taxi driver will know where it is. Thank you. So wait a minute. It's my turn now. He searched all the files and checked with everybody and says there's absolutely no record of this having been sent from our office. But it is signed Bennett, Compton, and Maxwell. Your firm, Mark. Then I'm right. Alan sent the cable himself. It's possible. But you see, this is dated May 31st, 1945. My father was still alive then. He handled all your aunt's affairs. Alan could have showed him the cable just as he told you. And unfortunately, now there's no way of finding out what actually did happen. First thing Monday morning, I'll call Callahan. It's the lawyer you met in New York. He may be able to tell us something. I hope so. Now, don't be afraid. I've got to get home now. I promised to take Chris to the ball game. You are afraid, aren't you? Sometimes, yes. But not when I am with you. That's what I want to talk to you about. Karen, there's no sense in our going... Oh, Mark. No, not now. It isn't right. What is right? For you to go on living with Alan, feeling the way you do about him? For us to exchange polite small talk every time we meet? Is it wrong for me to say that I'm in love with you? No, Mark, no. But it is wrong for someone to lie, to cheat. Even if only to find happiness and safety. Now what are we talking about? About me. I'm not Chris's mother, Mark. Karen Dernakova died in Benson. I took her papers and stole her name. Victoria. Yes, Victoria Kowalska. That's my real name. Victoria Kowalska. But, Mark, you didn't hear what I said. I'm not sure, Chris's... Sure, sure, you're not Chris's mother. What do you want me to do? Condemn a starved, scared, homeless girl who saw a chance for a better life and grabbed it? I saw Belson too, Karen. But I am trapped now by my own lies. Even if Ella lets me go, he will never let me have Chris. And I will not leave him behind in that house. Well, that's it. You've been living with us on your conscience for so long that you've magnified all these oh, things. No, please don't think that. Chris is in real danger. You said that before. Nothing is going to happen to Chris. Something is going to happen to him. If I only could make you believe it. 
I love him so much, and he needs me. I know he does. I'm going to talk to Alan. I think... Oh, no, Mark. Alan must know I told you anything. Uh, uh, there must be a way to prove all this to you. Will you stop tearing yourself apart? Take Chris to the ball game. Have some fun for a while. Karen. I said, take Chris to the ball game. Get away from the house for the afternoon. Would it help if I call later when I find out what Callahan has to say? Yes, call me. Maybe I... Now, don't do anything silly. Chris will be all right. Oh, I hope so. Hello, Margaret. Good afternoon, Mrs. Fender. Where's Chris? He's having his lunch. He said you were taking him to the ball game. I'll tell him you're back. All right. Margaret, uh... <laughs> Would you mind very much taking Chris to the game? He has been counting on it, and... I have such a bad headache. Well, I'll be glad to take him if you like. Thank you. Goodbye, darling. Have a good time. And remember, just one hot dog. Okay, Mom. And I'll get the scorecard for you. Bye, Mom. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Cable was sent in May. She wasn't dead then. Hello, dear. Well, well go ahead, finish your call. It's not important. Well, who are you calling? My watch stopped. I wanted to find out the correct time. Oh. It's about a quarter to two, uh, 14 of. Uh. Margaret called and said you weren't feeling well. I thought I'd come home and keep you company. Thank you, dear. It was just a headache. It's gone now. But, darling, if you have work to do, please, don't let me hold you back. I'm all right now. Well, of course, I can always find something to do. Okay, put on your coat and come along. The drive will do you good. Oh, I don't think so, Ellen. I'd rather stay home. Why don't you go? No. The work you'll keep until tomorrow. Even a 
thing, Karen. Why don't you try the souffle? It's excellent. Yeah, Mom, that's swell. I'm not hungry, darling. Would you like to have mine, too? Yeah, sure. If you don't mind, I'll go to the library and read while you're having your coffee. Well, go ahead, dear. I'll join you in a few minutes. Good night, Margaret. Good night, Mrs. Bender. Good night, darling. Good night, Mom. More jittery tonight than usual, darling. Hello? 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 Wrong number, I guess. Well, maybe he just changed his mind. Whoever it was. You look tired. You're going to bed right now. Come along. I think I left a cigarette burning. Feeling you left something behind, forgot something? I could have sworn I left a cigarette burning in there. And I wasn't even smoking. Do look tired, dear. So drink your juice and we'll turn in. I left my book in the library. I'm going down to get it. Now, how do you expect to get enough sleep if you stay up reading till all hours? Just for a little while. 
Please, Earl. Just a minute, darling. I'll get your book for you. Don't forget your juice, dear. It'll help you sleep. Uh, no, I don't think I want it tonight. It doesn't taste right. Well, what's the matter with it? It seems a little bitter. Bitter? Tastes fine to me. Come on, dear. Doctor's orders. your eyes. Aren't you going to bed, Ella? What is it, Ella? Why do you look at me so? I was thinking about a day not too long ago. We met in Callahan's office. You were scared out of your wits, but you carried it off magnificently. I thought then, this woman has everything. Breeding, brains, fire. I could be happy with a woman like this. And then something else said, watch out, she'll give you trouble. Trouble? What trouble could I give you, Alan? Well, don't be stupid, Karen. You know very well what sort of trouble. Alan, what are you afraid I take away from you? Is it the money? Money? <sighs> Scornful you are of money. You and Mark Bennett. All you people who were born with it. I should never have had to worry about money either. And Sophie's family had been wiped out in Europe. I was her only living relative. And what did it get me? 
job as a clerk in the shipping office for forty dollars a week. It's all over. This is the last time I'll have any trouble with your family. <laughs> you, you poles must be made of iron. You, Chris, that old land of yours. And it wasn't just Chris and me. You had to kill Aunt Sophie first. You sent me the cable that she was dead and, and then you killed her. Just like that. It's like powdering your nose. You think it's easy to kill somebody? It takes time and patience and courage. And a strong stomach. Oh, stop it! Stop it! I don't want to hear anymore. You are mad! Mad? If it's madness not to let someone take from you what's rightfully yours, then maybe I'm mad. Everything I've done, I plan with a perfectly sane mind. I've never wavered for an instant, and I'm not wavering now. This house is mine. The money's mine, it's gonna stay mine. You don't know what I went through with that old woman. You're Chris. I had to turn myself inside out, dance attendance on the kid like a monkey on a stick, just so she'd write me in as guardian for the boy. You think I was gonna give all that up? Just because you decided to come back from the grave, walk in and take over? Well, I don't care what happens to me anymore, but please, in heaven's name, leave Chris out of it. He's only a child. He can do nothing to you, nothing. No, nothing. Except take everything from me and kick me out of the house. If he ever comes of age. Alan. Don't worry, Chris is safe. I'd have trouble with Margaret if anything happened to him. the one that wanted to get rid of her. However, Chris is not of age yet. It's a long way off. And what are you going to do now? Kill me? I understand that Dr. Burkhardt has been giving prescriptions for your insomnia. He seemed quite upset when I told him I was the one that had the insomnia, worrying about your strange behavior. He'll be grieved, the little doctor, when he hears that you've been hoarding your sedatives to take them all at once in a glass of orange juice. Oh, Helen, you must call the doctor right away. No, not quite yet, my dear. Now listen to me. I... I didn't drink the juice you gave me. You drank it. You lied. No, no. I... You lied. I'm telling you the truth. I, I was afraid. And, and when you were downstairs, I put what was left in the picture in a fresh glass and, and poured the juice you gave me back into the picture. Hello. Hello. Operator. Something is wrong with the telephone. Library. <laughs> Library. Margaret. Margaret. What is it? She poisoned me. No, it isn't true. He tried to poison me. Get a doctor, quick. I tried to call, but something is wrong with the telephone. The, the library. The, the receiver's off in the library. <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> gotta keep awake. You gotta keep moving. <laughs> huh? Oh, no, you, you stay away from me. It's been busy for the last 40 minutes. Are you sure there isn't trouble on the line? Oh, did you get the doctor? Doctor, is he, is he coming? Everything will be all right, Alan. Isn't there something more we can do? Get out. Margaret, you must believe me. 
He wanted to kill me. You took him away from me. You tried to take Chris away from me, too, but you won't have either of them, whatever happens. Oh, Michael, get out! This is still my room now. Get out! Lie still. I'm going to be all right, Margaret. Something wrong, Mrs. Spender? It's Mr. Spender. He's taken... Make coffee, lots of it, hurry. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Gonna be all right? You remember, Alan. After the accident in the playhouse, I told you that nothing must ever happen to Chris again. Well, nothing did. I, I gave him my word. No word. If only I didn't know you so well. If I hadn't kept Chris from going with her in the car the other day, he might be dead now. I did it for us, Margaret. It was so... so we could be together again. <laughs> like old times. Old times. <laughs> and how long would it be before you'd try again with Chris? How long before you'd finally kill him? Mom! Darling! I heard noises. It was a dream, darling, just a bad dream. Come on, I'll take you in again. Where's the doctor? Should have been here a long time ago. He isn't coming. Huh. You left the receiver off the hook, Alan, remember? The phone is dead. Margaret, Margaret, you... You take the car, you get somebody. You can't let me die. How many times have you let me die, Alan? No, I'll make it up to you, Margaret. I swear I will. It's too late. You're going to die, Alan, and that way at least Chris will be safe. No. <laughs> can't be. Everything I've worked for. Planned for. I don't know how long it was before I realized that the doorbell was ringing. Uh-huh. And that was you, Mr. Bennett? Yes, Inspector. It was after 10 o'clock when I finally located Callahan in Washington. He said he'd never had any word from our office on the Albertson matter. He dealt only with Alan himself. So I called the house to have a showdown with Alan. I kept getting a busy signal. The operator said the phone was off the hook. So I drove right over and called the station. By the time your men got here, Alan was dead. Well, I'm going to have to take that governess downtown for questioning. Why? She didn't do anything. That's just it. She deliberately didn't call the doctor. She admits it. Well, where's that governess, Miss... Uh... Went upstairs to put the boy to bed. The poor kid couldn't hold his head up anymore. Oh, why didn't you let her take him? She didn't put him to bed. She took him away. She told me she never let me have him. Cover the back stairs and the garage. Chris! Oh, Mark, you see, he's not here. <laughs> He's all right. He's fast asleep. Because he's all right now. He didn't want to go into his own room alone, so I brought him in here with me. He fell asleep almost at once. I'm going to have to ask you to come down to headquarters, miss. I'm ready. Margaret, I know you are not to blame for what happened. What do you think the charge will be, Inspector? That'll be up to the district attorney. Everything will be all right, Margaret. I'll be your witness. My conscience will be my witness, Mrs. Fender. Sure, the DA will want to talk to you, too. You'll be available any time. We'd better go. Go? But where? I'm taking you to my mother's place for the time being. 
I don't want you to spend another night in this house. Yes, Mark. to her anymore. Do you think she'd understand? She'd approve. I know. She might even approve of me. Then all I can do is to thank her for everything. Let's go. Mm -hmm.